This is Everyday Warriors, and we highlight the people of everyday life that are our true heroes. In a society that, you know, looks at athletes and movie stars and music artists, you know, puts them on a, on a you know, this paramount, you know, puts them out there. Uh, we tend to highlight the everyday heroes, our law enforcement professionals, our firefighters, our EMS workers, our educators, special educators, parents of special needs children, special Olympics volunteers, special Olympics athletes, those kind of people. Those are the real heroes of every day. And I am Dr. Danny McGuire, your host. I am the program director and department chair for criminal justice and public safety programs at Calumet College of St. Joseph in Whiting, Indiana, where we specialize in educating public safety professionals in accelerated format to help them earn undergraduate and graduate degrees. I'm also the owner of ADL Wellness Solutions that provides training, education, and general wellness coaching for first responders, as well as an intern therapist at the Center for New Pathways in Schaumburg, Illinois. Today, we are talking to Officer Jeff. Officer Jeff is a Chicago police officer, a veteran Chicago police officer who has spent many years in law enforcement and is a hero of every day. So, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Danny. Jeff, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Um, tell us about, you know, your job, how you, when you started, how long you've been doing it, um, that sort of thing. Uh, I started in the, um, I started my law enforcement career in the uh, South Suburbs in uh, 2013. Um, I, I moved around a little bit in the suburbs. I worked in two different suburbs and then I got into the city and, um, so 20, what's 2022 already times flying. So 2022, I have nine years this March in law enforcement, uh, combined. Um, so I work in the city. I'm, uh, um, I've been with the city for uh, a little over five years. Um, and, uh, Every day's a holiday, so to speak. Every day's a holiday, huh? What do you mean oh, yeah. by that? Tell me, tell me what you mean. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's. Um, you know, I, I love this job. This job. Every day you go to work, you have to find something. And this this doesn't even pertain to police. I mean, a police. Job, I think this can pertain to any any profession. But you got to find something that amuses you and keeps you going. And. Uh, I tell you what, there hasn't gone, there hasn't been a day that's gone by in this job where I haven't laughed, a belly laughed at something, you know, or, or even with a coworker, you know, something that might have happened on the street or something that happened in the office, um, you know, every time it's a holiday, everyone's in a good mood. That's how you have to live your life. Go to work and, and live it like a holiday. Understood. So, in full disclosure, I I was a law enforcement professional myself <clears throat> for about twenty one years. Most of those in Chicago. So. I understand what Jeff's talking about and uh, potentially choose some of the ground that he chewed. So I do understand um, Jeff. So what is it that you really, really like about your job? Um, you know, I, I, it sounds uh, maybe cliche or something like that, but uh, the camaraderie with your coworkers is, is uh, I'd say paramount. Um you know, you just go to work every day. If you enjoy the people you're around, it makes makes your day go by better. You know, uh, I'm sure you could test this with all the time you had on. You know, you, you, no one could ever take away the laughs from you, you know. And you yeah. use all the fun times they have on this job. And as long as you're surrounded by good people, I mean, just it makes the years fly by for you, time fly by for you. Um, you know, and uh, I'd say another thing I love about this job is, um, especially being in Chicago, um, you know, I have a free front row ticket to the best show in the world. You know, it's yeah. uh, this, this, uh, I mean, it's obviously the city of Chicago. So for the listeners, you could obviously imagine what the city of Chicago is like, but um, you know, a lot of people might think negatively, but realistically this, this job is uh, it, it's a lot of, you, you get life experience very quickly as opposed to other jobs. Um, you know, it makes you, uh, grow as a person a lot quicker than maybe, uh, other professions just because of all the different scenarios you're put through. 
Um, mm-hmm. As police officers, you have to wear a different hat every single day. Not even every single day. Every single day, you're wearing multiple different hats. Um, you know, just for your average, um, just for your average beat cop, you know, just a, a regular uh, patrolman who's answering uh, call to call. You might go from a, a domestic situation to a suicidal patient to um, shots fired to a person shot to a person robbed, uh, or as simple as a, a you know an old lady. Uh, you know, we th- these calls exist. Uh, you know, like an old lady's like, "Oh, my fridge stopped working. I need like you know." It, it's it is what it is. It's community policing. It's proactive policing. It's um, mental health policing. It's there's so many different hats you got to wear. And, um, you know, it, take, it takes a lot, uh, especially being brand new. And if you, you know, if you don't really know anything about law enforcement, you know, you're just kind of going into it blindly, which I think mostly everybody does, um, unless you're like a generational police officer uh, like yourself, Deanie. Um, You know, you just go into it. It's not like a construction job or anything like that. You're just, you're, you're going in, you're like, wow, like I'm still trying to digest the last call of how hectic that was. And now I got to go to this next call. And then all of a sudden you get the call with the old lady and you're like, wow, you know, your adrenaline might still be cooking from the last, you know, three wild incidents you just went through. You might've just <laughs> had to fight somebody or something. And then all of a sudden you have a sweet old lady talking to you like, how you doing? You know, you want a piece of cake or coffee or, and it's like, wow, thank God someone was nice to me now. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's amazing. You mentioned a couple things that, you know, really resonate with me and that is different hats. Um, you know, when, when I came on the police department in 1992, right. Uh, were you even born then Jeff in 1992? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so how old were you in 1992? I was alive. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so that, that tells me Jeff was probably a newborn or maybe within I was, I was like two years old, two years old. There you go. So when I came on the job, you know, uh, there were a couple different hats that we had to wear, which I thought was interesting. I was a 21 year old kid when I was hired to my first full time sworn job. But now the hats that police officers have to wear are huge. So you have to be a social worker, a mental health specialist, a paramedic, or an EMT providing aid. You have to be uh, all all these different things. You know, you have right. to understand laws, which leads me to my point. Like, you know, find another job where you need so much recall knowledge and so much training in all these different realms and put that pressure on these public safety professionals, particularly law enforcement. It's amazing. How do you, how do you handle something like that? Um, I, that's, a, you know, that's a great question. Um, I'm not even sure. Uh, I'm not even sure what the uh, million dollar answer would be for that because uh, you get taken in so many directions. You could just give me the five hundred thousand dollar answer. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be the million. Five dollar answer. I, you know, it's uh, you know, you said uh, you, we got to wear big hats, and uh, what kind of came to mind was, I don't know if you, I get what you're getting at, but I would, I would call them heavy. They're heavy hats. The hats are a lot heavier these days, probably compared to when you're working. Um, and believe it or not, like we. I, Body, I don't want to get on the body cameras, but we have to wear body cameras um, when you're on patrol or you're, you know, uh, most people, you know, when you're going to calls and stuff like that, you have to have your body camera activated. And what the body camera shows is what's really happening for the most part. It's kind of almost exploit, like exploiting the, uh, the bad guy, the criminal. And, you know, you, we're, we're in such a professional standard. I mean, I don't think the I don't think law enforcement has ever been in the history of law enforcement has ever been the most professional it's ever been or had the most integrity it's ever had until right now. I mean, talk about transparency. I would agree with you. I I totally agree with you. You have five cameras, you have have ring doorbells, Uh, people have their own private cameras. Like, you know, the the old days of of all these horror stories of uh, uh, crooked policing or uh, police beating people for no reason. I'm like, that's just, that's not a thing. You, uh, you know, and you have, Policemen are educated. You you have to have an associate's degree at the minimum to become a policeman. But most departments, other than Chicago, a lot of departments um, require a bachelor's degree or they give you preference points for having a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. And, you know, so uh, I'm kind of getting off topic. But the point of it is, is, um, you know, you have all these heavy hats. So 
it's it's a hard thing to deal with. Um, you know, it's it, it, there's a lot of stress that goes into this job, um, and this job's not for everybody. But it's funny because I also think about this from time to time too. There are people in this world who I'm like, you know, you would make a good police officer, um, and it's not it's it's probably not what a lot of people would think. You're not looking for some um, crazy tough guy or some athletically built person. It's, uh, you know, just being street smart with your words and, and just learning how to talk to people. You have to make, I mean, I always go back to the scenario of domestic. You have to make both sides feel like they won. Right, Dan? You know what I mean? Social worker. Social, Social worker. worker. A mental and, health and, therapist. And, right. A marriage to, counselor. Yeah. And, <laughs> More hats. And, you know, I. Right. And as a, as a 20, as a, as a brand new policeman, you're 22 or 22 years old if you get hired young. What business do you have given a 40 <laughs> to 50 year old couple marriage counseling advice? Do you know what I mean? That's why in the beginning of your show, I, that's why I said this job makes you uh, grow as a person a lot quicker. It kind of, I mean, let's be honest, 20, when I was, I, I, won't, I shouldn't talk for everybody. When I was 20, 20, when I was 22 years old, I definitely was not this mature. <laughs> uh, I'm still not, but you know what I mean? You're definitely a lot more immature. You're kind of in that college party atmosphere. And then all of a sudden, boom, you get your first, uh, uh, not maybe not your first career, but um, you jump into the law enforcement career and then all of a sudden you're put into this like, oh my God, I'm actually like being called upon to solve people's problems. You know what I mean? And you're, you're not going to solve- I know exactly solve, what you mean. You're not going to solve years of arguments in a, in a 10 minute call, but um, you have to be ready for that. And you got to kind of make stuff up on on, on the spot. And, and I don't mean uh, that you're flat out lying but you know what i mean like you have to make both sides feel like they want just well, to you have you have to sure convince them to the you, know you have to just what i hear you saying what i hear you saying is that you you when you're in these situations that you you know it's a high stress situation you know everything you learned about marriage counseling you learned in the police academy right in right. probably like a four-hour block right maybe some uh scenario-based training you know i mean you know, for what it's worth, the Academy is the Academy, right? And um, they do a great job with what they have. And um, they're trying to teach a bunch of people on a fast track on how to become a marriage counselor, right? So you show up. And what I hear you saying is that you've taken the skills that you developed uh, in the Academy, your training, and you're, you're employing them. And you might not you know, tell them an outright lie, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to diffuse or uh, what's the word they use now? De- de-escalate, yeah. um, de-escalate a, a volatile situation. Now, I, you know, I've talked to many people in my, my position at Calumet college and as a mental health therapist, I'd like to work with first responders, you know, intern therapist, intern, and at ADL wellness solutions, I've talked to many first responders and, you know, consultation and things. And they, they ask me about this and I say, you know, here's the interesting thing. When you take, you know, a human being and expect extraordinary powers to come out of them when they're just human, it's, it's going to be hard, right? The expectations right. better be, you know, set where they should be. So you take, you know, a young person who, you know, some people may not have grown up in the inner city of Chicago. Maybe they grew up somewhere far away and their dream has always been to be a Chicago police officer because they watch Chicago PD. So now I'm going to be a Chicago PD person, you know, a dramatic yeah. show. And then they get there and they see like, wow, this wasn't my expectations at all. Right. Right. And you put them in a situation. All you have to do is rely on your training. So now you're, you know, this marriage counselor. And what I hear you saying is that you utilize the skills that you developed, you know, and were trained to try to come up with a peaceful resolve and the de-escalation thing. I mean, let's face it. Police officers have been using skills of de-escalation. Maybe they didn't call it de-escalation since the inception of police work, right? They, right. you know, when you went to a bar fight in the 1800s or 1900s, you just didn't, I, you know, and I'm only speculating, you know, uh, Patty O'Reilly, you know, didn't show up going, ah, sh- 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 sh, you know, and hit you with a stick. He just kind of separated everybody to find out what was going on. I think that's kind of util- utilizing some de-escalation skills. Right. You know, may- maybe the training has to be honed a little bit, sharpened through some training, but uh, in the end, I, I believe what you're saying is that 99.9 of the police officers out there 
are utilizing the skills that they developed in training and use those things to the best of their ability. And they're all trying to do the right thing. There's something else you said, Jeff, that I want to touch on. And you said that today's generation of law enforcement, which my father, you, you like me are a second generation law enforcement professional, right? right? My dad, my dad was a law enforcement professional as well, just like yours. So in my generation, it was different than my father's generation, but you're saying, and, and, and I tend to agree because I'm educating the police officers at Calumet College going back to school. The generation of police officers now are probably the most professional that they've been in quite some time. It's all relative to what you've been trained in society's, you know, push for, uh, yeah. you know, policing. So um, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. So how, how, do, how does, you know, how does Officer Jeff on a daily basis, how do you keep yourself with all these hats you have to wear? With all the things that now I know you work narcotics, you work a lot of times in a covert capacity. And I started my career in narcotics. So I, I understand what you're talking about. So um, how do you keep yourself, you know, mentally well? I'm just curious because it's got to be very stressful because, as we said, it's a lot different nowadays than it was in my time. When you, yeah. were, two, when you were two years old. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd be honest with you. Uh, exercise. Uh, I found exercise and uh, obviously the right diet, which is, I mean, anybody listening who's the police, they know uh, following a good diet on this job is extremely challenging because, um, you know, some days you go into work and you'll work your eight hour, 10 hour shift or your 12 hour shift, whatever kind of hour shift you're on. That day may turn into a 19 hour day or 22 hour day. And it's, you know, three o'clock in the morning and you're eating whatever food is available for you, you know, or, you know, you're drinking, you're drinking a cup of coffee at midnight and then all of a sudden 6 a.m. still, and you're still working on some kind of case or something big happened or, you know, and now you're going to eat breakfast. You know, I mean, it's tough. It, it's, um, and you know, it's definitely an easy art. I mean, it could be argued, uh, well, you know, it's not hard to pack your lunch and pack food like this, but you know, just as well as I do, boss might tell you hey go grab something real quick and get back here so it's like well grab something quick i'm not gonna run to the grocery store and you know at three, three the, what's open at three in the morning you know <laughs> white castles <laughs> you know, like, right so um yeah i mean it's uh it's it, the diet part's hard but exercising i'll I tell you what um when I, I i have bad days just like anybody else and uh on really bad days i try to force myself more so to go to the gym and uh my thing is running. I, uh, I'll do cardio and I, uh, I'll throw on the headphones, listen to music and I'll try to go for an hour and a half hour and just jog for an hour. And a half. I don't even track how far I go or nothing. I just throw on music and I keep going until, um, you know, like I just feel better. What are you, positive you're, stress. you're a doctor was serotonin levels, right? Mm -hmm. Posit well, positive stress on the heart, right? That's, yeah. that's, you know, the stress that you're, you know, putting on your body that's a positive thing you know exercise so um so when i when i got my master's degree from georgia in foods and nutrition right master's science food and nutrition i had to present you know like a project kind of and um it, it largely encompassed first responders nutrition because you know and when i painted this picture of what the first responders life was like in the way of nutrition particularly focused on a chicago police officer my it's my, my purview. It's what I understand. And, you know, and my access to was, you know, was to all Chicago police officers to interview them on this. And um, <clears throat> some of the people in my class, you know, offline would comment like, my goodness, I, it's really like that. I go, you could literally work a 16 to 18 hour day, eat once. And it's probably a pizza that you ordered after you made a big arrest with your team. You know, and you're eating pizza and you're drinking, you know, sugar sweetened beverages and you're drinking coffee off the chain to stay awake. And that is kind of what everyday life is like, you know, so where do you have time for fitness and where do you have time for nutrition and packing a lunch isn't really realistic because as you said, in a unit like yours, you could show up to work and your team could say, Hey, we have a search warrant ready. We've got to go do that right now, all the way on the other side of the city. And then you're there for eight hours. And you know, what happens? The pizza gets ordered, you eat the pizza, you drink the sugar sweetened beverages, you know, and it's, 
you know, the nutrition is not highlighted. You're not eating three squares a day and you're not eating five times a day, you know, nutrition plans aren't done uh, right. properly. So, you know, uh, many of the police officers I interviewed had, you know, metabolic diseases, like, you know, they had diabetes or heart disease or, you know, th these things that could be, you know, might be, you know, with the science out there might be controlled better with proper nutrition. Well, how, how do you do that? I mean, how can you do that? So I think you shed some light on, you know, your personal, uh, your personal um, nutrition Wait, yeah. and your, your personal uh, fitness, you know, and how you handle the stress. It's interesting right. because, you know, in my generation, Jeff, you know, we handled it at a bar, you know, Hey, where are you going drinking after work? You know, everyone smoked, you know, when I first started, yeah. you know, everyone went to the bar and you drank for four or five hours, you know, and uh, you know, and now the younger generation is different. You know, um, I always, I always make a joke, you know, and maybe I did in your class and I'd say the younger generation is smarter. They're more nutrition oriented. They're more exercise oriented in my generation. We'd be like, Hey, you know, what bar are you going to? Now you ask them, Hey, what bar are you going to? And they say, uh, I'm going to go run six miles. And you say, well, why would you want to run to the bar? I'll give you a ride in my car. You know, I mean, it's a joke, but I mean, it's true. So it all lends to say, you know, the officers in your generation, you know, are a little bit ahead of where we were, you know, and I think it's because, you know, I want to say it's because of technology, you know, internet, uh, social media, um, and things of that nature. There's more information out there on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I remember, I remember uh, having dial up internet, you know, AOL, you know, like, yeah. and, you know, you have that. now, now we have phones, you know? So, Right. Um, so Jeff, your current assignment in, in narcotics, um, you know, I, I, again, we're keeping Jeff's last name onto this because he, you know, he works in a covert capacity and he does a lot of good work and he and his partners and the people who work in narcotics for the Chicago police department are some of the heroes out there. I mean, it's an incredible, I, I, I did that job my first four years on a job in a narcotics task force in the South suburbs for the Cook County Sheriff. And it, it was, it was very difficult. To, to do that job. Um, yeah. So, you know, kudos to you and, and uh, your brothers and sisters and people who work uh, in narcotics, you know, I'm, I'm proud of every one of you. So tell me what it's, what that assignment is like. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's good. It's, uh, it's better than the patrol, obviously. Um, not knocking patrol, but. Uh, patrol is the uh, backbone was, of every police department. Patrol yeah. It really is the backbone. Is. I'll tell you what, I, I probably never laughed so hard in my life than when I was on patrol. Um, I'd say this is more serious than mm -hmm. we do. Um, not that we don't laugh, but we're in patrol. There's a lot. I, I, not better times we're had, but definitely, yeah, you know, it laughs a lot more. But this is, um, we go to work and we're going to work kind of thing. Um, so uh, I'm sure yeah. you see, I'm sure you see some. Um, could it, even from my perspective, you know, looking back to that time, I, I see a lot of, uh, a lot of pain with people in narcotics, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, um, you look at someone who's, who's selling these drugs, uh, you know, I often would wonder, do they know what they're doing to somebody, you know, who's addicted to these things? I mean, what, what's that like seeing the people who, you know, who are using these drugs and, and I mean, basically, you know, their lives are, are are changing for a negative. I mean, is that hard to deal yeah. with? Um, it's funny because I always say it's like we're behind enemy lines um, when we're buying from these drug dealers and stuff, uh, you know, walking down the street. And um, it's uh, it's incredible what you see when you're not wearing a police uniform and, and they just think you're another citizen or they think you're a hype or a junkie, uh, like another customer to them. And uh, I'll tell you what, um, yeah, you could you could almost see like the progression in, in the people. Uh, you know, you'll see like a young kid going to buy heroin, which is mostly fentanyl. And I mean, we could talk about the heroin epidemic for a whole 60 minutes. But <clears throat> um, I mean, you could see like the younger kids, younger people buying heroin. And then you see like the middle aged person. And then you see the old person, if you even make it to that old. And uh what the, what those drugs do is just deteriorates your deteriorates your body um i mean it's incredible it's incredible how physically physically addicted people are to uh opioids especially i mean there's mm -hmm. crack and cocaine out there i get that but uh um 
the opioid, the opioid epidemic is incredible. Um, you know, people are dropping like flies left and right. Um, and when you say dropping like flies, what do you mean? Like dying? They're dying. People are okay. overdosing and dying on this stuff. And uh, I remember talking to a, a, a fellow hype on the street when I was dressed up like a hype. And uh, I, you know, I told him I like crack, I think. And, and his, uh, his poison was heroin. And um, he's like, oh, man, you know, good for you. And I was like, good for me. Because he's asking me if I'd, I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> So he's like congratulating it. you because you're hooked on crack cocaine rather right. than heroin. He's asking if I like that... heroin, and I was like, "Well, no, I, you know, I never really tried that stuff." He's like, "Oh, good for you." Why is today? He goes, "Man, when I wake up every morning, I don't think about breathing. I don't think about eating my first meal, drinking water, going to the bathroom. I put on my clothes. I immediately head out the door to go find my my real breakfast. But by his mm. real breakfast, he means you know his drug. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's I can't, I couldn't imagine a life like that. Like, and, you know, that's um. Uh, I mean, it's tough. And, you know, this ain't, this doesn't, any person could, could this could happen to, you know, um, if you get injured at work and you're, you're taking painkillers or something, there's opium in them. You can get opium, you know, opioid addiction through pain pills and stuff like that. So it's not just um, poverty stricken neighborhood or, you know, it's not like any kind of class. It could be lower class, middle class, up class, you know, go look out in the, the South suburbs of Chicago in those ritzy neighborhoods. There's, there's, rich kids that are hooked on this stuff. You know, it's Mm -hmm. sad. It's crazy. You know, you said something there. I, you know, you, you said it and I heard it. Um, People dropping like flies. We clarified people dying. How, how big is the opioid, you know, heroin epidemic in the city of Chicago from your perspective as a narcotics professional police officer, how, how big, if you had to, if you had to quantify it, how big would you say it was? What, what, what is it, you know, in the percentage of drugs out there, what percentage would you say um, revolves around opioids and heroin? Uh, well, like deaths, you mean? Yeah, well, I'm just, you know, like people buying drugs, the drug arrests, things of that nature. Like how many people, I guess, I guess a better way to say it is if you can quantify how many people are buying drugs and what percentage of those drugs are opioids heroin fentanyl things like that oh, in your in your professional opinion um you know i, I would say I don't know, that's that's tough because um it's like everybody buys weed now because we but weed's legal mm-hmm. so it's not really like a drug but um you know it's cheaper than a dispensary but i would say that uh you know mostly like i, I would say 40 40 50 percent heroin and maybe you know, the other 50%, the other 25 and 25 would be like uh, cocaine or your party drugs like Molly or ecstasy and, and weed. But I'd say mm-hmm. 50% is probably opioids, if not more, give wow. or take the neighborhood or, or the area. But um, I mean, yeah, it's. it's. And how many uh, overdotes in, in your professional opinion being out there, how many overdose deaths do you think? And again, it's just, I, I'm asking you to speculate, not, you know, give me factual information, like from your street knowledge you know being out there every day as people are law enforcement professional how many yeah you have more uh, you have more opioid deaths uh than drunk driver accidents i think like you know fatal drunk drivers in the city of chicago um i mean the the people are dropping like flies from this uh you know i mean it's everywhere more people died from uh heroin overdoses than the coronavirus you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. it's it's, it's amazing. Um, and I guess I, I, I wasn't blind to it, but my eyes were opened a lot more to see these lines wrapped around blocks at seven in the morning of people picking up their, you know, getting in line to buy their dope. And like I said, I, I've seen every, I've seen every walk of life. I've seen people in, in suits. Uh, you know, I've seen <laughs> medical staff. I've seen, you know, people in business attire buy, you know, everyone's out there but it's, it's not just uh you know some homeless guy that's begging for change on the corner these are everyday people that are going to buy uh drugs and it's uh not much is said about it in the news you know what i mean uh it's amazing what gets covered and what doesn't you know right well that's <laughs> that's a whole topic for that's me, a whole sure. different yeah, what, yeah we'll need another 60 minute show for that right. maybe that's next a whole time. That's a bird yeah. of a different feather so we have to break for station identification sure, this sure. is wvlp 
103.1 FM, Valparaiso Community Radio, great community-based radio station. And you can go to our website at wvlp.org to check out our programming. Uh, This is Everyday Warriors. I am your host, Danny McGuire. And we have our guest, Officer Jeff, veteran Chicago police officer and narcotics officer for the Chicago Police Department. Um, Jeff, j- just to change a little direction here, I, you know, in I full think the true veterans might be upset that you're calling me a veteran. <laughs> what did you say? What was that? I'm sorry. I said, I said the real veterans might be upset that you're calling me a veteran. I don't know if nine years makes me a veteran. Just well, I mean, you know, let, let's be fair in a place like, you know, a big city anywhere, you know, big city USA, five years of experience in a big city, it, you know, could be 20 years in some places, right? <clears throat> Not to hey, discredit no- not to discredit no. our, our brothers and sisters in smaller agencies, but right, you know, right. Chicago, you know, this is this is you know, this is a different this is a different type of you know world you're living in. So to to change a little direction, um, in full sure. disclosure, Jeff is one of my students at Calumet College earning his undergraduate, his bachelor's of science in um uh, public safety management. Jeff, I, if you had to tell what, what do you think education will does for you as a police officer have, have you learned anything as you as you go on with your collegiate education have you um found it to enhance any of your skills or any of your thinking um critical thinking i think it sharpens your critical thinking big time um and you know what it's it's kind of funny um to hear other people's perspective um you know, on topics relating to the police world, uh, mostly our other fellow police officers. But um, you know, when, when, when you're at, when you're at the job, you don't when, when you're on the job when you're a policeman. Um, you, we in Chicago at least we don't really bounce ideas off each other uh, as much as we should. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. and I mean, I was on the South Side most of my career, so this is speaking as a South Side policeman. Uh, you know, when you get done with a call, you're like, yeah, whatever. And if it went bad, it went good. Either way, it's just like, wow, that was a wild one. Or, oh, that was good. You know, thank God that, that was whatever. But you're never like, how do you think we handle it? Let's, like, debrief how we did this. It was just like, no, let's, you know, let's go grab a cup of coffee. Let's go get food. Or, you know, what, what bar are we going to tonight? You know, you're not thinking about how you – but now when you're in a school setting and your, your instructor gives you, hey, uh, speak on this topic or speak on that topic, you're like, wow, you know, it's – you never really gave a thought. Now we were all kind of talking. And I think in certain aspects, it's made me a better policeman. I'm like, oh, you know, I never thought of it that way. Uh, that kind of works. Or on the flip side, you might hear someone talking negatively and you're like, wow, that guy kind of sound, or that guy or girl, or, you know, whoever they might be, um, you know, they kind of sound um, idiotic the way they're speaking. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I want, I, what, do I sound like that when I speak negative? You know, it's like, it almost kind of wakes you up like, maybe kind of bury that off to the side and, you know, mm-hmm. try to look at a positive light, which mm-hmm. in today's world, it's a tough thing to do, but, um, you know I mean? It's, it's what you got to do to keep going. I, you know, I, I, I watched a special on unfortunately police suicide, right? I teach a wellness course at the college. So one of the, one of the topics that we cover is police suicide and there's, you know, some decent information out there. And I was watching a video and there was, uh, a gentleman who was a chaplain with one of the police departments, a larger police department. And he said this, and I've always thought this since I, since I became a police officer, he says, police officers show up to, you know, domestics, car crashes, homicides, and you're going call the call, the call, right? You're not even taking a second to debrief what happens. Right. Then you're supposed to just show up at home to have a relationship, you know, and and as he put it, you know, you show up and you're like, Hey honey, I'm home. You know, now I've got to be the husband and the dad and all those things, which I just saw things that no normal people have ever seen. And, and I really don't think people take the time to understand that, you know, and in a place like in Chicago, you might not have time to sit back and say, Oh my God, I just saw a dead child right now. And now I have to go handle you know, a domestic disturbance. Right. right? So, right. you know, how, how do you, how do you regulate yourself with stuff like that? How do you, don't, how do you don't personalize go? anything? Right. Don't personalize anything. And uh, this, this may be an aggressive approach. 
or you know what have you. But um, my thinking is I'm not related to them. Thank God they're not related to me. Wow. You know what I mean? I, you I, there's uh, there's a thing in, in the police world. It's called compassion fatigue. Mm-hmm. Um, and once you've seen it all or seen enough of it, uh, rep- repetitiously, I guess you could say, a, a high volume of severely violent acts or, or, or the uh, aftermath of said violent acts, um, compassion fatigue. I mean, you know, it's like um, you see someone dead in a car accident or you see a, a, a young young kid shot in the, in the face, you know. It's like, man, I'm sorry to be gruesome on your show, but it's the truth. Um, it's what you see. You know, you're not going to sit there in the middle of the street and start crying and, or, you know, whatever. You just like, you know, you're just like numb to it. You just don't even think, honestly, I, I mean, for me personally, this is all coming from my perspective. It just, it doesn't bother me. Um, it's not that I don't feel bad. I have empathy. Like, you know, I'm like, wow, I would hate to be that, that kid's mom or dad or, or brother or sister or cousin or aunt, uncle, whatever. But, um, you know what I mean? I'm just thinking in my head, like, man, thank God that's not my neighbor or friend or cousin or relative, but what do you want me to do? What, sit here and think about it all day? No, I got, I got stuff to do. I got, I got to go to the next call. I got to go to the next job. And I think that's why a lot of people on the street, they almost look, <clears throat> they look at us like uh, you're on a crime scene or something. And, I mean, you've seen it a hundred times. You see like policemen standing around, they're laughing. They're not laughing about what just happened. They're talking about a call from earlier. They're talking about a funny thing that happened earlier. Like, it's unfortunate, but they see it so often that they're they're completely numb to what's going on. But are they really completely numb? Right. You know what I mean? Right. Well, that's, that's where you could step in and correct me. Um, you know, like you're it's almost uh, you're, you're, yourself, you're yourself. Your subconscious is digesting it and eating it. And, you know, maybe when you go to bed that night and you're sleeping, it might come to, come to you in a dream or it might haunt you or whatever. But um you know, when you're when you're awake and you're there, it's it doesn't even cross your mind. It's kind of whatever. It's another one. It is what it is. Well, it reminds me of the old saying, right? That that you know, if we weren't laughing, we'd be crying, right? I've heard that on the police department. You know, when I served, you know, more than once, when someone would say, "Hey, if I wasn't laughing, I'd be crying." And you know what? There's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. You know, I mean, the things you're seeing are just devastating. I mean, yeah. it it is, you know a young person shot, you know, it, it's, you know, repetitive on repeat, like you said, Um, you know, I, I remember being interviewed by, uh, by someone um, and they had asked me, we were talking about law enforcement and I, and I challenged that person and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I said. And I want to know your thoughts on, on my, on my comment. I said, I want you to find another job. I challenge all your listeners and anybody else to find another profession where someone straps on a bullet resistant vest, because we know that not all bullets are stopped by the vest. You know, there's some bullets that can go through and harm you a bullet resistant vest, a gun, a body camera, a taser, go out into the field on a daily basis, leave their home, whatever their life roles are outside of being a law enforcement professional, whether it's a, a mother, a father, a, you know, a partner, whatever you are, son, daughter, you go out and in a given moment, seconds, seconds, you put yourself between someone who's trying to do harm to a perfectly good stranger. Milliseconds. Right. And you've never met this person. So someone, someone had commented when I had brought that up before too, not only in the interview, but they had said, well, there's no, you know, they went biblical on me. You know, they said, um, there's no greater love than to give your life for a friend. And I said, this isn't even a friend. This is someone you've never met before that could have been in a barbecue. They could have been in a barbecue an hour before that and said, hey, F the police. We hate them. You know what I mean? And now you put yourself between this person who's trying to do them great bodily harm or death and you give your life for them. What do you what? How do you feel about that, Jeff? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think major- I, I really think a majority of human beings um like the police even even the people you could be at a, a family party or an event or whatever and you got the person going oh you know f12 or you know the police this or police that but um who my question would be 
who's that person going to call when uh, someone's breaking in their house? Who's Correct. that person to call when they're getting carjacked? They ain't calling the vice lords or gangster disciples. They're calling nine one one. Correct. You know what I mean? So, um, it's like you obviously have some kind of thought about the police that you like that you would call nine one one. Otherwise, you would handle every situation by yourself. You know, you hear that tap on the window late at night. Might be a tree branch. It might be the boogeyman. But yeah, I know you. I know you're going to call nine one one right away. You know, so it's like. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, I, I think it's kind of BS. I think, uh, can I say BS on the show? I'm sorry. Sure, you could say like, BS. I can <laughs> act them curse words, I just can't say them. Right. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, it's, uh, I think majority of people like the police. And as a policeman, um, yeah, we do we do, do uh, things for strangers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, in milliseconds. But uh, you don't have time to think. You just react. Um and that's not something you could really put into words. I think it's a very hard thing to put into words. Um, I'm sure somebody can, but I can't. Um, you know, you're driving down the street and uh, gunshots start going out, or you on view just uh, someone getting beat up, like a, a, you know, say a woman's being beat by her uh, boyfriend or husband or something. You know, you just jump out and you react right away. Um, you know, and it is what it is. It's 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 just what you were trained to. It's what you're supposed to do, and I don't know. That's that's a million dollar question there because it's like, you know, that's just what you're taught to do. It's what you're trained to do. So and everyone else around you is doing it. So it's almost like um, it's passed down from office, veteran officer to rookie officer. You know, you, you watch what they do and you follow, you know, what's been done for years. Well, it it you know, you you mentioned it in your commentary and and you know, you rely on your training. So that's where training and effective training is vital, right? Because I, I remember. Which we uh, don't get enough of, by the way. Well, you know, uh, I, I remember being on, on uh, my, one of my assignments on the police department and I would pay out of pocket for training and people would, you know, get on me going, well, if they wanted you to have that training, they would pay for it themselves. Well, you know, we didn't have budget for training. So I paid out of pocket, you know, a thousand here, 2000 there, a couple hundred here, a couple hundred there to go <clears throat> to certain trainings to prepare myself to handle situations. And that's where training is vital. And then, then, <laughs> you know, I remember having a discussion and maybe you've had this, you know, uh, someone said any training is good training. And I said, good training is good training, right? Good education is good at, you know, good education. Yeah, right. 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 And uh, the education that you learn on the streets of a place like Chicago um, is is pretty vast and quick. It's fast. It's like drinking from a fire hydrant. I mean, yeah. you know, go back to your first day on the job out of the police academy. How many calls would you say you answered? First day. You talking about Chicago or are you talking about yeah, Chicago, here? Chicago. How many calls did I answer? Mm -hmm. I, In your eight hour I, shift. I have no idea. Way more than twelve, more than fifteen. <laughs> so more than uh, you know, more was, than a call an hour, more than a call an hour. Oh God, by far, yeah. I remember. Uh, I remember one. I remember my. I remember my very first call on the job, um, on, the, on the Chicago Police Department. I came from the suburbs, and um, suburb policing is different than city policing. It just it is what it is. Um, and I, we went to a domestic call. We got, we walked up and everybody is fist fighting. Everybody is intoxicated. Um, your first call, alcohol. your first call, first, first call. So they didn't um, like, they didn't wait a minute. They didn't like spoon feed you like here. We're not going to give you like a really bad call first. We're going to give you, you know, the, like you said, right, the old lady calling right, about the refrigerator, right. not working. They're yeah. just giving you the fire hydrant full on wham. Here it is. Well, well, let me ask this. Who's they? Who's that? The, the police department, you know, I mean, you know, the yeah, police department, they, you know, they, they don't have that power. Your it's expectations, here. right? Here's your car. Here's your training officer. And <laughs> he's going to show you what to do. Yeah. This ain't like, uh, you know, if you're, <laughs> you're in some kind of construction gig, they're like, yeah, hey, guy, uh, take the broom and mop all the stuff up uh, after we're done doing our job. Because I work construction for the police. And that was that was what you didn't you didn't start the job and you're all of a sudden operating the crane or. You're not up on a ladder uh, doing the main job. Hey, you're sweeping up the, the ground stuff. On this job, they they feed you to wolves, so to speak. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, tell, tell me problem. about that first call. You show up. It's domestic. Everyone's show fighting. Up, um, yeah. This, uh, this girl, she's uh, in her early 20s. Um, her one eye is completely shut closed because she's beaten. Her lip is busted open. Um, she's dripping blood all over the place. Uncles are fist fighting. They're arguing. And I'm going, well, who, who called? And uh, she goes, are you going to get him or not? And I'm like, kid, who? She goes, my boyfriend and beat me up. I'm like, well, which one is it? And she goes, he ran out the back door. I go, why are those two guys fighting? He goes, oh, those are my uncles. They're just drunk. They always fight. And, and these, these two these two guys are going at it. And she's like, no, we didn't call about them. I called about this. And then across the street, some naked lady comes running across the street. And this is this true story. Middle of summer. It's 4 p.m. Broad daylight. Naked lady's just like, oh, my husband just raped me. So now I'm like, well, which call do we which call do we do? Like, do we <laughs> take care of this lady who just claimed she was raped? And I'm, I'm not. La- I'm not laughing about the story. I'm laughing. No, no. At, it's, at, it's insane. You know, like you're. And then, you're uh, you know, this girl's this your girl's first just day. Me, this girl's just telling me she's like, well, he ain't going to do nothing. They ain't that F you guys. And she just storms off. I'm like, well, what should we do? And the guy in my training office was like, she no longer wants police service. And I'm like, well, what about all the people inside fist fighting? He goes, we have more cost answer, more priority level one cost answer. We don't have, literally have time for this. I'm like, what about the lady that just got <laughs> criminally sexually assaulted? Hey, well, you know, we'll, we'll get back to her because she's not actively. Being th- she said it happened two days ago. I'm like, well, wow. why is she naked? Well, I don't know. It's this is the gal. This it happens. You're like, what? Let's move you on know? to the next call. Right? Move on to the next <clears throat> call. Do we have a person shot around the corner? We have to go to that. That is priority one. We need to go render aid and do this and find out who shot the person. But I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is this is a lot to digest. This is the first call. And I mean, don't get me wrong, too. Um, we have slow days and that. You know, slow days are, are probably uh, faster days in, in a quiet uh, village or small town. But uh, we have time where we have d- some downtime. You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's nonstop uh, craziness. But, yeah, I mean, from the month of May to the month of October, I mean, it's it's rock and rolling, man. Uh, especially in fast districts, uh, pretty much anywhere on the south or west side of Chicago. Um, I mean, it's. It's crazy. Like, like I said in the beginning, it makes you grow quick. Um, well, you know, I, I remember when I was promoted on the police department to sergeant, I had, I was in a specialized unit prior to that. And I went to, um, <clears throat> I went to patrol and uh, I'm a sergeant on midnights in patrol. And I remember uh, asking on the PDT, the, you know, the computer, <clears throat> yeah. I'm sure they look different now than, yeah. than they did in 2007 asking how many calls for service we had. And it was like 356 calls at like, you know, 1220 AM. Right. 356 calls. <laughs> and I, I was blown what district away. Were you in? Uh, I was in the eighth district. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> see, that's the thing is people think like, Oh, you know, uh, like when, when you start your, when you start your shift as a, as a patrolman, as a beat cop, when you get in your car and you're in a fast district, you know, the dispatch right away said, oh, okay, we have a couple on backlog here. We have Get your pencil. That's you. what they used to Hold tell it. us. Get your pencil ready. Right. Write these down. Holding, we're holding an offender here and doing this there and blah, blah. And, like, people think, like, oh, okay, you know, so you have 15 calls. Well, you know, if you clear one, you're down to 14. No, the calls are still coming in. You're on right. 16, 17, 18. They just they, – they, some, some days they literally just don't stop. And right. um, I would say majority of them are BS – but I would say 60% of them are not that they're not bonafide, but it's just, it's the same song. What do you mean? What do you mean by like BS? Like, you know, like uh, if I hear you correctly, let me, let me try to paint an example of what I, what I, when you say BS, what I hear. So our listeners understand what you mean. So like you'll get a call of a um, shots fired and it's probably like 15 minutes old. So you show up and there's nobody there. Right. There's no, there's no shell yeah, casings. Exactly. There's nobody there. Right. Someone called the police because someone was probably hanging out on the corner. So they, rather than saying, Hey, these, these gang members are hanging on our corner. They said they're shooting. So this way the police come faster. Exactly. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's other ones where, uh, you know, just, just a, a boyfriend, girlfriend argument. And, uh, you know, like they'll call the police. Well, guess what? We have an armed robbery, a person shot. We got um, a mental health disturbance. 
um, where this guy's suicidal or he wants to fight the police or whatever. So you have all this stuff going on. And in the meantime, this person is calling for their just verbal argument domestic. It is the most important thing to them in the world. And they think nothing else in the world is going on except how terrible their day is going. And they need the police right now. Well, and you know this just as anybody else. And they do this all the time in the ghetto. They call the police and they go, oh, my boyfriend has a gun. He's pointing it at my face. Well, you get there. Boyfriend doesn't have a gun. He never pointed at his face. And they tell you. And I always I always ask him, this, why did you say that he had a gun? He has no gun. Well, I just wanted you guys to get here faster. Well, thank God that was recorded on body camera because you just broke the law. Right. You know what I mean? <clears throat> right. you, just, you, just reported, you just reported a false report. You know? So with and, that, with that being said, <clears throat> the issue with that for our listeners who might not know, when someone calls and says, hey, the boyfriend's pointing a gun in my face and you expedite your response to that call and you get there and the boyfriend doesn't have a gun and it's all baloney. Um, right. that means there could have been another call that was legit that the boyfriend was pointing the gun in the face or right. shot. Right. And you just wasted you just resources wasted and time because you wanted the police to get there. Right. Um, you know, I remember the dynamic and maybe it still exists today. I've been gone for a while, but uh, it exists today where you would show up on a domestic and something would happen. And then they would say like, um, Oh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want them arrested. I just, I just want you to yell at them or something. And it's like, yeah, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not the disciplinarian in your house. You know what, right? you know, if you don't mind, I cut you off, Danny. Yeah, you sure. know what I always told people on that? What? I said, we're not bouncers. We're not bouncers at a bar. We don't mm-hmm. kick people out of their house. Right. You know what I mean? This is where the social worker comes in. This is where right. like you, you having to wear the hat as a, as a law enforcement professional, becoming a marriage counselor and a social worker, you right. know, in a place like Chicago for our listeners, you, you know, you look at the call volume on a daily basis. And if you, if you actually did the research and I think you can go to the OEMC, the office of emergency management and communication website, and probably find out how many calls in some sort of fashion they're on a daily basis. I think most of our listeners that would look at a number like that would be taken back by how many calls for service there are every single day. And that's why I say, and you can agree or disagree, Patrol officers are the backbone of the police department. They do the work of a hundred people in a day. So, you know, kudos to the patrol officers of Chicago and all of uh, all of the suburban areas, the Northwest Indiana area, uh, where our radio station is Valparaiso <clears throat> kudos to those patrol officers that do these things and handle those calls. I mean, how how does how does someone do that on a daily basis and then flip a st- switch and and you know be expected to be you know on you know function in a normal way you know right. there's so much negativity so in our last few sure. minutes uh, the last few minutes we we we've got about you know six more minutes to go here in okay. our interview I, I really want <clears throat> I really want you to tell our listeners you know I, in full disclosure again I've, I've known Jeff for a while. We lived in close proximity for a little while. And, and Jeff, he's a very humble person. He, he really is, which is why he's my first interview. He, he's an incredible police officer, and he is a very humble person, right? And um, Jeff has, has these inner qualities of a person that, you know, is very professional on the police department. So when I, when I hear Jeff talk, I think you're just being so humble. So... In our last few minutes together, Jeff, I want you to tell our listeners what you really feel like on a daily basis as a Chicago police officer professional and how you keep yourself <clears throat> regulated and normal outside of your jogging and your, your working out. How, how, do you, how do you handle every day? Like, what is it that makes you keep going to work, I guess, is what I'm asking. Oh, uh, man, for my next job interview, I got to bring you with me. <laughs> that was a hell, heck of a promotion you just gave me. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, you, know, you live day by day um, kind of thing, which probably sounds unhealthy, but, um, you know, you got to, you got to take every day for what it is. And you got to, you have to develop a optim an, an optimistic outlook. And one thing that I, I've, I've heard this phrase many times, but I never really gave it deep thought misery loves company. 
um, you know, there's negative people on this job. And I was, I was negative for a while. Um, you know what I mean? Obviously like through the riots and, and the uh, crazy looting and stuff that happened, I'm like, man, you know, this job sucks. And blah, you know, um, you look at it for this. You know what I took that as now? I look back and it was experience. You know, there probably couldn't be a uh, knock on wood, but there can't be anything worse than that, than that stretch of a couple of weeks or months when all that craziness was happening. And now I look at, um, you know, every day I'm like, man, if I made it through that, make it through anything. And most officers, uh, you know, a majority of Chicago police officers all went through that. They all saw it. I mean, it's some of the crazy states. And you know what? More importantly, citizens saw us go through that. And um, people that lived in these neighborhoods uh, in Chicago or, or the people that were downtown and saw it or whatever, you know, they saw this going on. They're like, man, and I know it deep down there, like, man, thank God we have the police here. At least they're protecting somewhat of this. Or, you know, we, we need someone to call to come, you know, help us and blah, blah, blah. And that, you know, we're talking about the police. So this this goes for the fire department, too. I mean, the firemen were running, putting out burning buildings and stuff, and it's crazy. So, uh, I mean, but anyways, going back to your question, living day to day, uh, you know, it's exercise, talk to family members, talk to friends. Um you know, people need people. If, if if people didn't need people, we'd all live on the top of a mountain in a in a log cabin by ourselves, and we went. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're, I, we're, I, we're social people. We're so human beings are social. You need one another. It's just it is how it is. You know what I, I mean? I uh, and I always laugh because you always get that one person that's like, I hate people. You know, it's like, no, you, no, you don't. You need each other. So, I think that's it. You know, it's a great job, and uh, thanks for having me on your show, Dan. Yeah, no, <clears throat> Officer Jeff, Chicago police professional, uh, thank you for, for being here. And I just wanted to close out and, and, and say this, that, you know, this show is to highlight the everyday warriors, the heroes of everyday life. As I said in the beginning, in the opening, in a society where we put these athletes and these movie stars and uh, these music artists, you know, paramount on this hilltop and make them above reproach, you know, they're, they're just incredible people. Um, there are everyday heroes out there that make the world go round a whole heck of a lot more than they do. And I once heard a, a man say in an interview that um, uh, he was uh, in some community group in Chicago and it was, you know, talk radio on the way into work years ago. And he had said, if you can't look across, if you can't look across your table for a hero or find a hero in your own home, then you, you have bigger problems than we can, than we can address. So, you know, that is, that is a very, very true statement. And, you know, officer Jeff is, is a real hero and there are several thousand real heroes out there every day. Uh, not just law enforcement, but you know, in other aspects, there's parents every day, you know, I have a special needs adult son, uh, that I, that I care for. And, uh, you know, that in itself is, is difficult. And I see other parents that he does Special Olympics and Special Rec activities with. Those people who work in those programs are heroes. Uh, you know, for me, a lot more than maybe someone who, you know, throws around a ball or, you know, sings a song or maybe makes a movie. For me, that's a that's a real hero. And I think for most of our listeners, uh Officer Jeff, you, you are a hero. So thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Danny. Appreciate it. And this is WVLP, Valparaiso Community Radio. Uh, you can go to our website at WVLP.org to look at our programming. And I am Dr. Danny McGuire from Calumet College of St. Joseph, Program Director and Department Chair for Criminal Justice and Public Safety, as well as owner of ADL Wellness Solution and Therapy Intern at Center for New Pathways in Schaumburg, Illinois. And you have listened to Everyday Warriors. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And catch us next week when we interview Detective Marcus Shepard from the Chicago Police Department, financial crimes detective, who will talk to us a little bit about financial crimes and what that looks like in the city of Chicago. So everyone have a great day, and we'll see you next week.